Well, it's the only morning I get to sleep late. Or we were going to have company. No, they didn't come, but we thought they were coming. And I've heard this one several times. Well, I just can't stand to come and look around and see all the hypocrites. Now, as a young minister, and I would take on them one by one and try to unveil them as flimsy excuses, like the hypocrite one. I'd say something like, look, do you really operate under the erroneous assumption that we're embarrassed by our clientele? We're no more embarrassed by our collection of sinners than a hospital is embarrassed by its collection of sick folks. Come on. So that's what I'd do. I'd take them on one by one, but then new ones would pop up. One church I served, uh, there was actually a member of the administrative board. And he would apologize once a year. He said, I know I'm not there very often. He's a turkey Christian. He'd come on the high days, you know, the Thanksgiving and the Christmases when turkey was being served and somebody in the family is being baptized. Um, he said, the reason I can't be there is I, I work really hard during the week, and this is the one day I get to play 18 holes of golf. Now, what made this a little harder on me, we went to Rotary Club together and he would actually have the nerve to come up and tell me how well he'd done the week before. He said, I had a birdie 13, 14, and 15. Now he didn't know that what I had been hoping and praying for were the providential winds to blow against him. And <laughs> you know the score would have been like a hundred and eighteen, something like that. But no, I know that's a bad piece of theology. The rain and the winds blow on the faithful and the unfaithful. I don't argue with folks anymore when they make excuses. I don't even argue with God about it very often. I think I'm at the point, I, I just pray and I hope that those persons will come to that place where they will find that um, one sustaining reason for being here. And that's the longing to be in the presence of God. Well, um, you're here. We need to celebrate that. I, I look out there, I'm seeing faces that I see week after week. Uh, you get up and you say, this is who I am, this is who we are, and this is where I'm going to be. Yeah. There's a lot of things we do as Christians. I would contend that some of those practices are rooted just a little bit in um, societal expectations. Not totally, but somewhat. Some of them are even grounded in law. You know, they're forbidden activities. We say we're not going to be doing those things. I guess what I'm saying is some of what we do as Christians, well, it might even fall under the realm of the enforced, but what we're doing here today, it's uh, purely willful, voluntary. Oh, I know there's some children. They're going to argue with me and say, well, I'm here because mom and dad said I'm going to be here. You'll have your moment later in life to make your choice. There's probably a spouse or two that's here because you got dragged here, but for the most part, it's, it's voluntary. They say the best test of someone's values is to see what that person chooses to do with unlabeled, unallotted time. And that's what you're doing here this morning. Yeah? This is your time, most, for most of you, unallotted, unlabeled time. And here you are. I remember how my mother played that out, you know, willfully, voluntarily, week after week, us as a family. What we're doing here this morning actually began on Saturday night, okay? She'd start fixing Sunday dinner on Saturday night because we would always have company for dinner and I don't know how she did it we'd come home within 15 minutes we'd be eating this big meal but she'd start on Saturday night and then there was the cleaning and the shining of the shoes and the laying out of the clothes okay there was this sense we had that the next day Sunday Sabbath was going to be a different kind of day and and this was not obligatory preparation oh no I, I I always had the sense that it was rooted in a kind of expectancy. We were going to be going into the house of the Lord. And who knows what would happen, but there's a good chance something would happen, and by the end of it, we'd be in a different place. Okay. Now, I can hear that same sense of joyful anticipation in our psalmist, willfully, voluntarily, but joyfully. He gets up, and you can tell he's doing what he does week after week. He gets up and says, I'm going to be enter 
sing the gates, the gates of worship. I'm going to be doing it with praise and thanksgiving. I'm going to go there, he says, and I'm going to get to my feet, and I'm going to applaud God. I'm going to sing my way into God's presence. He describes what he will be doing with and for God. Almost making a fool of himself, the way lovers have always made fool of themselves for those they love. You can hear it. There is this sense of expectancy. But then I read on, and I would have to say it's an expectancy that's grounded. It's grounded in the language of participation. Did you hear the verbs, the verbs in the psalm? Active verbs, people getting up, and the psalmist is doing things, going place. To go, to enter, to sing, to pray, praise, to bless. It's a language of participation. I would contend that so much of vital worship, you know how it dies? It dies when somebody walks into the room and they're sitting in the role of the spectator. It's like going to the theater. You know how we are when we go to the theater. You get your big old bucket of buttered popcorn, your Coke, you plop yourself down in one of those big old recliner seats and you say, okay, Hollywood, I've done my thing. I've paid my price, I got my popcorn, now you entertain me, you mesmerize me. Here I am. I would contend, if that's all we bring into this place, it will not be all that it's meant to be. I always glad that when they asked me to come to confirmation class and talk a little about, about worship. Uh, I still use blackboards, nobody uses blackboards much anymore, but you know, I always use a blackboard and I say, kids, I know you like to draw and like to see things. So let's, let's talk about worship as a theater and, and let's draw this together. Now go on, tell me some of the props and the settings. And, and the youth are good at that. They'll talk about the altar table and the flower stands. They'll talk about the baptismal font, the pulpit. And they'll have the choir loft and the balcony and the pews and we'll, we'll have it drawn there. I say, now let's talk about the actors. And they'll mention the acolytes. Acolytes, you always get mentioned. Talk about the ushers, talk about the choir, talk about the folks all helping here. Those are the actors. And I said, well, what about the congregation? They said, well, that's, that's like the audience. I said, okay. And then I get to the end of that and say, is that it? And they say, yeah, that's it. That's it. That's the whole picture. Who, who got left out? Yeah, God. Soren Kierkegaard, existentialist philosopher, preacher. He said, we're going to have to flip this whole thing around if you want to understand the worship theater. He said, everyone, congregation, preacher, choir, all of us, all of us are actors on this holy stage and drama called worship. And we're God. God is in the audience. We are playing out our lives and our faith being addressed by and addressing God. A lot, a lot of times the preacher, I, I know you always see us as the lead actors, and sometimes we are. Right now, I guess I'd say I'm one of the lead actors. I'm talking. I'm the only one speaking. But a lot of times preachers are just prompters, saying now it's time to confess. Now time to rise and sing. Now it's time to pray. Now it's time to empty our pockets to give. Think about all the activity you've already been involved in this morning. Began in the parking lot. That's when worship starts. It's called the gathering. You get out of your car and you say hello to an old friend. Or, or you think about somebody you haven't seen in a while. Where's the Brown family? We've missed them. And you say to yourself, I'm going to give them a call this week. And then you come in here and it's not long before um, someone says, let's get to our feet and applaud God. Let's sing. It doesn't matter how you sing. It doesn't matter if you sound like Willie Nelson, you know, gargling grape nuts. You, um, you find your voice. It's a way of being lost in love and wonder and praise. You've already been asked to stand and turn to somebody you may not have even known, but they're your brother and sister, so you pass the peace of Christ. and You'll come in a little bit and you'll receive the bread and the wine. There's a lot of action. I would contend even what you're doing right now is not all that passive. You know, a preacher who's been wrestling with... The scripture for six or seven days comes and says, now it's your turn to join me. And you join until that scripture starts probing and questioning you to the point it becomes a living word. Participation, if you so choose, and that is a drama that I think what is going on here is like a dress rehearsal. 
for what goes on in our Monday to Friday world, how, how our faith has played out in the rest of our lives. You come here on a Sunday morning and you hear that ancient prayer, Almighty God unto whom all hearts are open and from whom no secrets are hid. You hear it. Now it's Thursday night. It's been a bad day. You're at home. You're alone. You're, you're feeling misunderstood. And that prayer comes back to you. And you realize there's someone who loves and knows you to your depths. It goes on and on. This is a drama we're all participating in. It's like a dress rehearsal. You can hear it in the psalm. It's the language of participation. But I would contend beneath, behind all the words, most of all, you're going to hear the longing. What is this psalmist about? Why is he entering the gates? He says he wants to know God. He said, it is he who made us and not we ourselves. And so he goes to have a conversation with someone who is going to take him beyond what he would go to left to his own devices. It's the longing and desire, you see, to open ourselves to the inexpressible, ineffable, mysterious truths of God. That's, that's the core. Alfred Luckett tells his story. It's a Methodist church out in Dakotas, rural church, pretty far away from places. And you know how it can snow in the Dakotas. And heavy snow came, it was up to your chin, and the mail trucks couldn't even get there during the week. Which meant this Methodist congregation did not receive news from the Methodist headquarters about what was the emphasis for the week. They were used to receiving that. So here they are on a Sunday morning. They don't know if it's United Nations Sunday. They don't know it's the festival of the Christian home. And so Luckhuck said the preacher strode embarrassingly to the pulpit and said, in absence of any other reasons to worship, we'll just worship God. All right. That is the core, though. It's the vocational core of what we're about when we come here week after week. We don't come here to just find five, five healthy tips for living, ten guidelines for good homemaking. No. No, we, we come here to have our hearts and minds commingle with the very heart and mind of God. That's why we're here. That old Yiddish poem, Der Yicker, Oh, it's a, it's, it's a delightful poem. The, 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 the poet just goes litany and line after line saying this and that is not the main thing. He just kind of whips them off. This is not the main thing. That is not the main thing. And he gets to the end of all this and he says, However, beware not to conclude lightheartedly from any of this that there is no such thing as the main thing. That's the main thing. Beware, friends. Because there are so many motivations for people to come to worship, not to conclude that there is no main thing. No, there is. It's the heartfelt desire to address and have our lives addressed by God. The longing may sound like this. I'm tired of living by the damp, dim lamps of the world. I, I want to be in a place where the light is so bright and so pervasive that everything is put into a new perspective. I want to I, I be follower of our light and life that carries me to the farthest edges of truth, where I can curl my toes over the edge and I can feel the mist in the face and the fog in the throat. I want something bigger than, greater than, more substantial than, what are we going to have for supper? Or where are we going to eat? Or what are we going to wear? Helen, do you want to go shopping? Oh, I don't know. No, I want more than that piddling nothing. See, I, I want to find my life, our life, the world's life, in the presence of God. That's the longing. But now hear this. I believe that longing is there, and I believe that's the heart of worship. But let's also be honest. That's going to be commingled with a certain degree of fear. What's the phrase? Fearful, wonderful worship. It ought to be a little fearful. What we're talking about coming into the presence of one who is sovereign, who is free, living, demanding, who will not be housebroken, domesticated, 
You're going to come here and you're going to hear things that are going to stretch your relationships, that are going to turn your moral sensibilities on their head. They're going to teach you new ways to think about how you, you make and spend money. Annie Dillard says she doesn't understand how worshipers are so calm and casual. They come into here and uh, she says they don't understand. They think they're playing with little childlike chemistry sets when they're really mixing up a batch of TNT. Worshipers ought to come, she said, wearing crash helmets. The ushers ought to be handing out signal flares and safety vests. We're coming into the presence of God. So, of course, yes, there's the longing, but also... There's the resistance. You ever do this sometimes? You get here and, I don't know, it all starts getting a little closer, more important than you wanted. You start looking for distractions. I see it going on sometimes. It's okay. I don't take names up here, but, you know, count the light bulbs. Uh, <laughs> guess the weight and ages of your fellow worshipers. Look like you're taking notes, but you're really making out a grocery list. <laughs> See how many grad grammatical errors the preacher's making. Open your pew Bible and, and try to read a scripture other than the one that's before us this morning. Yeah, we're looking for that escape hatch sometimes so we can get out of here and get away scot-free. I understand that. It's, it's, this, is, <laughs> this can be fearful business. Longing, yes, but also resistance. I mean, who, who wants to have their life distracted by the truth? Who wants to have a nice, comfortable day ruined by Jesus? Huh? Oh, you got two clo cloaks? Give them both away. Go the second mile. Turn the other cheek. Ooh. Oh, you think you're, you're already there when all you're doing is loving only those who already love you? Forgiveness, 70 times 7. God, kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. It's, um, this is expansive, mysterious business to come into the presence of God. Longing, yes, but it takes some courage. It takes some courage. True story. A minister sees a young man, 25, 30 years of age, coming out, doesn't recognize him, said, here, we're very glad to have you in church today. Is this your first time with us? He said, yes. In fact, first time I've ever been in church. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. Well, how did it go? How did it go? The young man said, well, to tell you the truth, it was a little scary. Scary? Said the minister. Yeah, yeah. The whole thing was just a little frightening. And the minister says, I don't remember saying anything that would come across as Hostile or no, it wasn't anything you said. It just, it all seems so important. He says, um, I feel a little uncomfortable at events where everything seems important because you know how it is. It gets in your head, and gets in your life, and it just, it won't go away. And he says, I guess that's why I prefer parties. The minister shook his head and says, Will you be coming back? And after a long pause, yes. Yes. I do not know the mood, all that was going on in the mind and the feelings of this psalmist. I do have the sense that he was doing what he did week after week. He got up and he entered the gates. And yes, sometimes it was probably demanding and overwhelming, maybe sometimes even a little fearful. But he came back week after week. Why? Because he wanted to be a part of something important. He wanted to be in the presence of God. And he knew after it was all said and done, it would be life-giving. That's why you come back, I think. We don't, we don't take attendance here. We're not keeping score. So willfully, voluntarily, you keep coming week after week. As you come, will you do this week after week? Will you come as a joyful participant? And will you come and pray that the Spirit of God will open out, up your heart and dig out your ears? And then, who knows? 
it might happen. Your life will never be the same again.